This is the Coach's Wife Life Podcast. I'm Kristen Ergel, your host, a former TV sports reporter and fellow college football coach's wife. I'll go one-on-one with the strong women who are the backbone of college athletics and athletics of all levels. And now, Coach's Wife Life. This podcast is brought to you by Ruler of Hope. Ruler of Hope is a nonprofit that supports medically fragile children. If you'd like to make a tax deductible donation, you can use Venmo at Ruler Hope or online at rulerofhope.org. Hey there, I'm Chris Nerlon. We have an exciting podcast ahead. But first, I want to talk about something we all know way too much about moving. Just the thought of that can bring an unsettling emotion. Well, I found a team that can take that load off your plate. It's D1 Relocation. This group can do it all. They can organize your move, coordinate with a moving company, and a trusted real estate agent. They can actually vet key household partners, such as schools, insurance agents, physicians in the area. They can even help set up your Wi-Fi and water. It's incredible. So I've come to know this team, which is actually founded by a coach's wife. I think you should check it out. Whether you're looking to move now or in the future, it's d1relocation.com. Now on to our awesome podcast. It's my honor to bring Alex Montgomery on the podcast. Alex is the wife of Mark Montgomery, assistant men's basketball coach for Michigan State. Thanks so much for being a part of us. Thank you for having me. You guys are back there starting your third basketball season. We're at all again. He was a four-year starter, very prolific there. And overall, 13 years combined coaching at Michigan State. This past season, a Sweet 16 run and three players with all Big Ten honors. You've had coaching stops at Central Michigan and a head coaching stop at Northern Illinois. That's what everyone talks about, right? So tell me from your perspective, what do you think makes him special? I would say hands down, it's it's his passion for what he does. He loves coaching. And, um, you know, he obviously played and was a very – very good student athlete at Michigan State and played a little bit after college as well, but it's hands down. He was meant to be a coach. He um, just loves that opportunity to mentor young men, and that's that's what keeps him going. He's been coaching for over 25 years now, and it's those relationships and that opportunity to mentor um, that he just he loves and can't get enough of, and I think that's what makes him so special because the time at this level and the commitment and the pressure and the hours away um, and away from his own family um, that's really tough. And it's just the, the opportunity for him to coach and be a part of young men's lives um, that he that he loves loves and keeps him going. Okay. Did you ever see this playing out where you would be a coach's wife? <laughs> Gosh, no. <laughs> I was a political science major. <laughs> so, so not even close. Um, no. <laughs> not at all. Okay. So you said you met not too far away. Tell me how it went down. How did you meet him? You know, I was out to dinner with a girlfriend of mine. Um, I worked for the state of Michigan right in Lansing, and there were very few females in state government at the time. And so this new girl was in our office, and I was like, hey, let's go to dinner. So we went out to dinner, and and then she called me like half hour before dinner. She's like, I don't want to cancel on you. You're a new friend. But one of my friends is in town, and he's meeting one of his friends. You know, can we all just go out? I was like, yeah, sure, that's fine. So, um, we went up to Champs right here in East Lansing. It's kind of like a sports restaurant. And it was the day of the national championship football game. So she and I were having the game, watching the game, having dinner. And then uh, her friend ended up meeting us and he was nice. And then his friend was Mark. <laughs> and so nice. he got there late. He was off recruiting, um, came home late from recruiting Draymond Green. I know that's a household name from Saginaw. And so he was his friend's friend. And yeah, it was, we had a good time. That's how we met. Wow. And now you've been married for, you said it to me before we started recording, 15 years as a coach's wife. I know. Crazy. And three children. Right. And right back where it all began, which is kind of funny too. (laughs) Full circle. Getting them ready for games is a lot of fun. Putting on the uniforms and Mm -hmm. t-shirts and things that mean so much to your family. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So this business is tough. I mean, we see it firsthand every single day, whether, no matter what sports you coach, no matter what level you're on, I mean, high school, college, NFL, uh, Major League Baseball, I mean, all of us kind of go through the same thing in different ways. So talk to me through some of the moments in your life that maybe haven't been the easiest in the coaching profession. And what did you rely on to get through those moments? I know it's so true. Um, We all go through it. I would say like right off the bat, faith and family. Um, Our our hardest moment was when 
Mark was let go from Northern after 10 years. And it's just so hard and crushing as the spouse to watch your husband put in everything day in and day out and give it his all and his heart and soul and blood, sweat and tears and time away from your family just to be told that his good enough isn't enough, you know, and I beg to differ. But <laughs> so that was, you know, that was the hardest moment for us. Um, and then to turn around and tell your kids that the only home they know that they have to leave. So and we, we've all done it and we've all gotten through it. Um, but for us, it was faith and family that helped us the most, you know. My parents were right there packing boxes with us, telling us it's going to be okay, reassuring my kids that they're going to now only live an hour from them, you know, as grandparents. So that was, you know, that was very cool. Yeah. Um, cool. And then faith in the Lord. I mean, that's just, it's been our strength and our backbone through it all. Love it. Couldn't love it more. Okay. So since coming back home, yeah, had some pretty special moments. It was. I mean, tell me what a sweet 16 is like. Tell me what the NCAA tournament, you know, I have a lot of football wives on. So describe that type of atmosphere. I mean, you're I mean, big 10 basketball. It's pretty I special. Know. It is very cool. Big 10 is, um, it's a special basketball conference. And um, I mean, March Madness kind of sums it all up. I know you hear it, but when you like really break down the, you know, the words of it, um, March is just crazy. Absolutely. Anything can happen. And you know, last year we had a historic run in the Sweet 16, and I think that, um, I mean, we were as caught off guard and pleasantly surprised as anyone in the country who had brackets filled out. So we did, uh, let's see, I think our first round was in Columbus, Ohio, we played two games there, and then we went to Madison Square Garden for the Sweet 16, and it was just, I mean, such a, you know, to be in the garden and have my, I told my parents, I was like, I don't think our kids appreciate, you know, how cool this is, you know, to take a bunch of pictures, and one day they will, but... You know, it's just, it's an amazing place in history and had the opportunity to play there. And we did some landmark stuff while we were there also. I took them to the Statue of Liberty. We saw Ground Zero, um, Times Square, kind of that. Um, so it's just, it's absolutely incredible. Um, it's now, really nice to have that opportunity to share this part of coaching with our families because, you know, their husbands are away so much and they miss a lot, you know, holidays or birthdays. Um, so to be able to partake, you know, in their biggest scene is really cool. You know what I mean? A lot of our friends can't say the same who have husbands who work in corporate America. You know, we don't go and like, there's no peanut gallery in boardroom. <laughs> so it's really neat to be able to share that with our families. It absolutely is. So just kind of enlighten us a little bit. So when you make the NCAA tournament, you all the families get to go, right? We do. And that's something that um, coaches Zoe and Lupe as Zoe have just absolutely created that foundation here. I mean, they Coach has been here. This is his 28th season. So, you know, he was a head coach before he had children. He raised his children through this program. They still are an integral part of this program. Steven's on the team. Um, so they are family through and through. So absolutely. So they wouldn't have it any other way. Families go on these trips. Um, now, if you have a kid in com competing in sports in high school, it's a little different. But they would they encourage everyone to go. And, and that's what makes it so special. So we do. We all travel together. Um, so conference tournament is first. And then we all as a staff and as um, team program administrators, everyone comes and watches the Sweet 16 selection show on that Sunday. And so we all kind of crowd around and, you know, we watch it and then that's how we know, you know, where we're going for that either Friday or when, you know, Thursday or Friday is when you play. Um, and sometimes you leave the next day, you know, if you're playing across the country, it's like, okay, go home and back, <laughs> you know, and it's, it is, it's so exciting and everyone's really into it and it's a fresh start. It's just, yeah. It's a it's a great time. And for us football wives that are watching, our games are usually seven days apart. We're not playing so quick. I mean, do you stay nervous the entire several string of days? Or I is know. it excitement? Does it go back and forth? Can you focus on anything else? I think um, I think the kids are a great distraction. Otherwise, I'd be a ball of nerves all the time, probably. You know, you pack and you plan to stay for – so it's like split up by weekends, basically. So you pack and plan to stay for, for two games. And, you know, there's a day off in between. So, you know, we always try and do some sightseeing in the city that we're in um, Columbus. And we found like a really cool, like indoor place. Usually there's a great zoo we can take the kids. And that is a perfect distraction because, you know, the, the coaches don't have time, you know, to, to see us. You know, we wave to them in the stands and that's about it. Um, but no, yeah, keeping the kids busy is, is a perfect thing for our worried minds. <laughs> Do you have any traditions before the game? Do you try to go see coach before they get coach Monty before the game or uh, no. post game? What's your thing? Yeah. Our thing is definitely before the game because um, a lot of our games are during the week and they're late. You know, we even have some nine o'clock starts. And so 
um, I try and take the kids before so they can see him on the court, you know, warming the players up, you know, and he's in his sweats then too. He's not even in his coaching sideline attire. Um, so the kids get to really see like, this is what daddy does, you know, and then they go up and eat and then, you know, then they go back and shoot more. So it's important for them to see the process and not just hear it. Um, and then also when the players are being announced, my husband always looks back at, at my sons and waves and they think that's just really cool. <laughs> so, Very cool. And all that happens before the game, because sometimes if it's late, then we do leave at halftime or sometimes I'm lenient, let them stay a little longer, but. Are you in the arena? Are you sitting somewhere else? Like, can you hear the crowd? Oh yeah. Yes, definitely. We sit um, just behind the bench, about 20 rows up. So you can feel it. I mean, Breslin Center is rocking every game. It doesn't yes. matter. Um, it's packed in there. The student section is incredible, intense, loud, you name it. They're, um, they're, they're awesome. Um, Do you ever we're think just about, we're just behind them. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever think about what your kids are experiencing <laughs> growing up? that you did All not time, get. I'm like, and it's so unnormal. <laughs> I don't even think our kids process this. Oh, I know. And I try and tell them, I'm just like, this is such an amazing opportunity. I want you to take it in. And I think what helps the most is um, I let my nine-year-old bring a friend when it's a weekend game. Um, and then that's fun for him and and everything. And the, whenever I ask the friend's parent, I'm like, hey, you know, can someone come with us to the game? And they're like, oh my gosh, can I come too? <laughs> and, you know, and, the, and I think that, um, you know, having the friends say what a cool experience it is, or this is my first time ever at a game, kind of reminds my kids that this it's not normal what you get to do. So, yeah, definitely not normal. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've been doing this podcast for several years now, and a lot has changed. This year, I kind of went into it thinking, you know what? When I started this, there was no NIL, there was no transfer oh. portal, and we've all adjusted and adapted to those things. Um, how have you seen your husband adapt and change to some of this? And what's been different from your perspective? You're at a power five. Obviously, you have you're more resourced than other universities that um, that are facing this. But what is how has it changed you at all? Yeah, and we've been at both sides of it. When Mark was at head coach at Northern, um, you know, we didn't have those resources and um, and that would be a very different conversation right now because I think we'd be feeling it and talking about how, you know, we lost out on recruiting opportunities potentially because of something like that. Um, I would say that the transfer portal doesn't affect us as much as it could. Um, Coach Izzo is very old school in his recruiting. He likes to go and recruit high schoolers and develop them for four years. Um, and that's, that's not a secret. I mean, that's just look at our roster and I think we have one transfer. Um, and I love that because I love getting to know these kids. And I think that all of us coaches wives do because we invest time on the official visits, getting to know their family. And, you know, I mean, it's just, it's really special. You know, they're giving up a weekend to be with us. They're feeling us out as much as, you know, we're trying to, you know, show them around and are you a good fit here? Um, so to be able to, to get to know them from their junior, senior year in high school, you know, and then four years here, I mean, it's, it's really, it's a unique opportunity and we're so grateful for it. Do you enjoy the recruiting process a little bit? I mean, it's it's fun. It's scary sometimes when you invest in somebody. Like, oh my gosh, that is I, I know it's rushing, but so then sad. it is fun to get to know people. Yes, it is. Sometimes it's really sad. You're like, oh, but I really loved your family. <laughs> I wanted I wanted to see you guys more. Um, I do enjoy the recruiting process. I really do. I think that you know, just the way that it's so regulated. You know, there's never really a surprise. It's either a dead period or recruiting period, and you know, so it's it's very structured and the way we set up. Um, official visits, you know, we spend a whole weekend with families and it's just, it's incredible. You know, coach has us over to his house and it's, you know, a really cozy, warm atmosphere. And, um, and I just think that's how you get to know, you know, the person and not the player. So that's what, that's what means so much to us. Well, that question. Okay. I mentioned it. Year 15 of being a coach's wife. What's one thing you're glad you made a priority in your life? You know, I would just say like sneaking, sneaking moments in, even if it's just grabbing my kids real quick out of school to go have lunch with dad. If I know he's going to be on a road trip for a couple of days or a couple of late nights. Um, and then, you know, having the kids, um, they go to bed pretty early cause they're young. Um, but then when he gets home, you know, at nine, 10 ish, you know, having an hour together to either watch a show or pack lunches while he's finishing up film, um, just sneaking in time in, and it doesn't have to be fancy date night. Um, or anything, you know, special. It could just be some stolen moments that really add up to a lot. And that's what's important to do. Most coaches wives will not answer this question, but I'm going to try. Okay. <laughs> anything that uh, you could say, actually, if I had him on. Okay. 
he would probably give you credit for some of the success that he's had in his career, right? I mean, no one does these things alone. There's a lot of sacrifice yeah. on all of us. So if there's anything you could share with us, give us some tips, um, maybe some things that helped to get him where he is today. I think that um, like, I see my job as just kind of like running everything at home so that he can focus and be the best coach he can be and not let him, you know, have any day-to-day -day pressures about like the little things, you know, like the construction project going on here or, you know, the spilled milk in this quarter, you know what I mean? That's all just kind of handling everything here so that it can be fun and light when he gets home. And we know we're not stressing about the little things that really, you know, don't matter. And that when he can make it to a sporting event or, you know, join us for something unexpected, it's just a true delight, you know, and it's never like, oh, dad, this is the only game you've been to all year. You know, it's like, <laughs> whoa, dad's here. <laughs> this is great. That's true. Um, yeah, I really think that that's, that's the best, that's the best thing we can do because then he can perform his best where he's needed, you know, and that's home um, with the players, of course, on the road recruiting. Um, if we keep the, we keep it light, and that's, we're doing our job at home here. This is year three for you. So you moved pretty recently, a couple of years ago. What are your moving tips? Um, uh, things that you could help us out with someone that's maybe about to move and that is pretty soon feeling like they might be moving soon. So what would you do? How do you get connected? I'm sure it was a little bit easier getting connected there, right? Where you're from or, or where you had been before. But still, things change a little bit. Just because you're going home, sometimes that was a different season of your life. And some of those people aren't there anymore. Yeah. I've yeah. done that where I've moved to a city I've been before. Like, wow, it all shifted. You where know, where did it go? So, yes. What, East what are Lansing, some of your tips yeah. there? Yeah, downtown East Lansing looked totally different. We both were like, whoa, there's high rises here. This has never looked like this. Um, but no, yeah, you're right. It was, it was 10 years apart and it was, you know, pre kids and post kids. So now it's a totally different ballgame. Um, I think the kids almost make it easier because you you meet people through their schools or daycares or, um, you know, whatever it is that you're involving your kids in. Um, I know right away that our two boys went to the same school and I met a bunch of wonderful families through that and through a little soccer team we signed them up for. Um, so that definitely made it easier. Uh, and then, um, I, you know, at a big school, just the vast network of people around you that immediately love on you because, you know, you're green and white. So, uh, you know, neighbors always stop by and hey, I have a high school that would love to babysit or, you know, um, but then on the flip side, you know, when we moved to Northern, um, in 2010, you know, we didn't, we didn't know anyone, you know, that was our first time on campus was his interview there. Um, and that was really tricky. So I would say our tips would be probably moving right away. I know that that's hard and you hate to pull the kids out of school, but you just got to remember that like for us, our family unit, you know, we're best when we're together. And, and so that's, you know, it's, it's not always convenient, but it's for us, that was the right decision. So picking up and moving right away. And then the kids were able to, you know, jump in school, have some friends. We made it through the summer with, you know, that core group we initially had, and then kind of full fledged, ready to go come August. Speaking of children, I feel like sometimes our kids get a lot of expectations on them. Um, they get a lot of pressure. Uh, to play sports, to do very well, especially if they're dad or mom, but dad, we, we kind of in this whole profession because of dad, um, was highly successful, obviously playing Big Ten basketball. People make comments. Have you thought, I know yours are young right now, but I feel like you start shaping children to handle those expectations. Have you started to have little bits of conversation about taking the pressure off or how you might handle some of that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do. I have an amazing role model, Lupe Izzo, um, who just reminds us that, you know, we are our kids' biggest cheerleader, of course, and that, that's your number one job. And then just that they need to hear it from us, you know, that every people is going to talk around us, but you just need to keep your head down and listen to your coaches, you know, your community around you and just stay close and stay strong. Um, again, ours are younger and that hasn't happened yet. But I can see, you know, in our nine-year-old, um, you know, he didn't want to play basketball this year. He just wants, he just wants to focus on a different sport. And I was like, Nicholas, you don't, you don't have to play basketball because your dad did. You know, you can play it because you enjoy it. And then you can, you know, don't ever worry about that. It's not like that. And, you know, Monty's so smart. He saw that coming years ago. He's like, the last thing I'm going to do is push this kid in my sport. So <laughs> he's a very proud nine-year-old soccer player. And, you know, he loves that because he has an identity away from you know, dad a little bit. And we just think that that's awesome. Um, and we only want to support whatever his, his dreams are, whether it's 
chess, sports, <laughs> you know, drama, you know, anything. Um, but no, and it's hard and our kids aren't on social media yet. Um, thank goodness, because I think yeah. that that makes it so much more difficult. You know, potentially they're receiving information before you have a chance to talk to them. And I mean, that's, that's like all parents first worth nightmares um, yeah. in the profession. So um, I think just building them up and keeping them really strong and knowing that they are loved and supported at home, keeping their foundation really intact and is our biggest, our biggest job. I think you could speak to this. Obviously, you're in a part of a program that's doing extremely well and high success. So speak on the behalf of other programs right now that may not be having some good success. What would you hope that fans would remember when they see coaching families go through things? I think just that, that they're a family. You know what I mean? I think people love to look at the coaches and think they live in this, you know, segregated world over here where it's just sports, sports, sports all the time. And um, but there's an individual behind that. You know, there's. There's a whole family, there's children, there's a family, and there's um, a lot of people that rely on them. I just wish that people could see them as an individual and not just as a coach, because there's, there's so much more to the man than that. <laughs> we had an open week this past week and I was watching a okay. game. I'm not gonna talk about specifically who it was, but I was thinking about, they almost lost, okay? Very okay. unexpected for them to lose. And I was thinking of just in those few moments that their fan base would probably be oh, turning on them very quickly. So when true. you think about they did the exact same thing. I know that they won last week mm -hmm. and they and, it, and they squeaked it out. But I'm just yeah. I was looking at it like, oh, this could go. It's one way or the other. And yeah. it's, it's so hard when you you just want to go. They're doing the exact same thing and they don't want to lose. Like, I, know. I know it's a game of inches or, you know, a yeah. point here or there. And it's, it's really, really difficult. And, you know, we sit there and we, you know, sweat through these games and there's just, there's, there's so much on the line all the time. And yeah. um, it's hard. And I think that the, the average fan just doesn't have any idea to be yeah. perfectly honest. How do you block things on social media? You mentioned your kids aren't on there yet, and that's wise. Yeah, uh, how do you how do you block it yourself? Because I I mean I see things that people will say, and it's hard. I know it's really hard, and um, I am on social media. I do try and like, you know, I do it mostly when we lived out of state to keep in touch with family here, so they could see our kids growing up. Um, but no, I'm definitely still on there now. And if I need to take a day or two off because of what's going on around me, um, and I and I don't want to read it. I, I just do. And, and that's probably the best way I can say, you know, it's easy to read it and just power through or get mad. And um, that's just not my personality. I'd rather just be in charge and turn it off and keep my keep those comments <laughs> where they belong and not in front of my face. <laughs> Definitely. I've definitely written some emails that I don't ever send. Right? I know. Get it out. No, it feels good though. It is. Or put in the notes section. Maybe yes. not email. Put in the notes section. Exactly what you'd want to yeah. say, and then don't say. It. Articulate. It. <laughs> yep. Exactly. I'm old school. I still like the hand write things, and so you know what. Sometimes, oh. sometimes we we have to sit down and write some letters <laughs> that yes. that never make it out of the house, but that's okay. It feels for good sure. To pen to paper. It's a good therapy for sure. Okay. Do you have a coach's wife mentor? Oh, without a doubt, Lupe is. Oh, she's just the best. She's absolutely incredible. I mean, like I said, they're in year 28 years. She's just a pillar of strength at home. Um, she's 100% Tom's backbone. And um, she's just what she's done in this community. It's just, it's incredible. She's amazing. Practical ways you try to connect with Coach Monty's players to let them know they're valued there. You know, basketball, we've it so much easier than, than you football wives because our numbers, <laughs> you know, we only have 13 on scholarship. So having the team over is not that big of an endeavor. Um, I mean, it's a huge deal to my kids because I think it's the coolest yeah. thing ever. But, um, you know, we love having them here. And I swear to God, that's the reason Mark put a pool in it so we could play water volleyball with the team because um, he loves having them here too. So I think we connect by just reminding them, you know, on the recruiting visit, you know, we're all together as a family with their family. And that's, you know, that's what we, we preach, you know, we want that. We love that connection. So um, I would say in the spring before they head out, you know, they get to go home for a couple of weeks right after classes get out in May. So we do, um, we watch NBA basketball. The playoffs are usually getting going at that point, have them over for a meal. And then when they come back in the summer, we have them over to swim and just kind of relax, do a little cookout. Awesome. Okay. So how do you stay connected during the season? You talked about maybe putting the kids to bed early, having a TV binge watching night. Is that kind of your way to kind of. Yeah, we that? do. We do. We keep it really simple. Um, and yeah, our kids go to bed pretty early. So by the time Mark gets home, you know, I, 
house is like put back together again. And I'm usually just in the kitchen, putzing around, packing lunches for the next day. And he'll just finish up some film right here. And yeah, that's, I mean, we do, we're not very exciting, but we have at least two hours together and you know what I mean? That's, that's everything in the middle of a busy season. So, oh, yeah. um, so it is a great connection. Yeah. We do, we watch a little bit of TV and sometimes I make him pack some Cheetos for the boys. <laughs> Um, I know the, the repetition of packing lunches. You know, by the time I hit March, I'm like, oh my goodness, can I pack I another lunch? I, I seriously, I'm like, I'm gonna make them do it. And I'm like, no, <laughs> that's not a good idea either. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. When they get a little older, they do help out with that. That is that is helpful. But then I feel guilty. So then I'm backpacking lunches, you know? So <laughs> I hear you. There you are. Okay. So what do you enjoy doing when you get some downtime? What are you involved in there? Well, um, I would say downtime is limited, um, but we just, you know, we love watching our kids. You know, we love being a part of them. I know we take a, a family trip every May. There's a good dead period in May. Um, we love going somewhere warm, you know, um, usually beach in Florida. Um, so that's a great place for us all to, you know, know that we have a family vacation. It's hard because we compete over Thanksgiving, um, Christmas, of course, Easter sometimes too, if it's you know, end of March, like it has been at times. Um, so, so to look forward to that vacation, um, is a really big deal for our kids because they know, they know it's going to happen. They know they're going to have dad at home for, you know, seven to 10 days. Um, well not at home, but dad in the same building <laughs> for seven to 10 days. Um, so that's our big thing. Um, and then Monty really does. He loves going to the kids sporting events and he can do such a better job than me. I'll be on the sidelines. We're like, go, go, go. And he can just sit there and take it all in and relax and, um, so I would say that's what, yeah, that's pretty much where you can find us if he's not on the sideline. In Michigan you get State. pretty nervous when your kids play because I do. I do, I do. And I never thought I would them. be somebody that would get nervous over twelve-year-old softball, but here I am. It's unbelievable. I know. I know. That's okay. It's good for him. It is okay. If you could relive one moment as a coach's wife, what would that be? Oh, that's a good one. Um, okay, one moment would probably be the two thousand and nine Final Four because it was right here in Detroit. And so, I mean, making a final four is just an absolute incredible accomplishment. And then to be able to do it in your backyard is just really, really special. And there was a pep rally at um, a nearby mall because it's, it's March and it's Michigan, so it's cold. Um, there's a pep rally at a, at a mall, Somerset Mall, right down the street from where the venue was. And the place was, and I grew up going there all the time, um, and the place was packed. I mean, all you could see was just a sea of green and white. And I mean, when we showed up for the, the pep rally, you could just tell that coaches, you know, all the coaches' wives were just looking around and we couldn't believe it. It was really breathtaking. And then a couple of days later to follow that up and to be, you know, at the final four game at Ford Field and the same thing, you know, just packed Spartan fans and all you could hear is chants of green and white. It was it was really a special, special environment. Wow. Unforgettable. It was. Rapid fire questions. Are you uh, ready? Let's do it. Okay. I never do blank at a basketball game. Oh, sit down. <laughs> <laughs> dress up or dress down at the game? I go dress down. Favorite college basketball atmosphere outside of yours? Not a chance. The Big Ten is bloodbath we can't yeah no favorite venues outside of our own <laughs> okay my claim to fame Ooh, um my baking i love to bake desserts okay what do you make cupcakes um yeah you name it i do it i love making cupcakes though you get a night alone what show would you binge watch suits what's your go-to meal to cook jambalaya oh yeah, like coach, it. yeah coach loves it what would be your walk-up song? Oh, that's a good one. Um, probably Black Eyed Peas. Um, let's get it started. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Thank you so much. It's been so much fun to get to know you, Alex. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. This podcast is brought to you by Brewer of Hope. Brewer of Hope is a nonprofit that supports medically fragile children. If you'd like to make a tax-deductible donation, you can use Venmo at Brewer-Hope or online at BrewerHope.org. For a replay of this episode or previous episodes, visit CoachesWifeLife.org and follow us on social media at Coach's Wife Life.